All right, this is Joe and Cola with GrowingYourGreens.com. Today I have another exciting episode for you. I'm on yet another field trip. I'm here in West Palm Beach, Florida at Mount's Botanical Garden. And I'm here specifically because actually at Mount's today they have a huge plant sale in Orchid Show, but also a huge plant sale with a lot of local vendors selling mostly non-edibles, but there are some vendors that have edibles. So the purpose of this show today is to show you guys some edibles that you can buy that are going to grow well in South Florida. Now, if you're living anywhere other than South Florida, take all this with a grain of salt because South Florida has unique uh, weather and climate here that allows them to grow tropicals. A lot of the things I'll be talking about today are tropicals and they're not going to you know, make it in northern climates unless you grow it in a protected, uh, enclosed environment such as a greenhouse or something like that. I mean, these guys will also grow probably really well in Hawaii and some plants may do good in you know southern texas and south california where it doesn't get too cold anyways uh, let's head into the botanical garden and uh, check out today's plant sale so now we're walking through the botanic garden botanic gardens are a great place to visit i mean most of the plants being grown here and trees are like non-edible but they have a small section with the edible vegetable garden I always want to encourage you guys to support botanic gardens in your area, even become a member so that you could get into free into your bo local botanic garden, but also they're networked together. So if you're a member of your local one, you could also get in uh, botanic gardens that are in other states as well. So now we're at the entrance of the uh, vegetable garden just across the path there. And now we're going to share with you guys actually uh, what grows here in South Florida at this time or pretty much at the end of April, early May. And they have definitely a lot of vegetables growing and some people might think you can't grow plants or edible food crops in the summertime because it gets too hot because most people in South Florida will grow actually vegetables in the in the winter what's known as all, the regular winter because that's when it's cooler but it's absolutely true that you can grow edibles year-round in South Florida if you grow the right things so keep in mind the crops that I'm going to show you guys now are the crops that are growing right now and maturing now so you would want to have planted them earlier if you plant them now they're probably not going to do well but later in this episode, I will show you some things that you could plant pretty much any time of year and they'll continue to produce food for you. So besides the vegetable garden, we're also going to look at some of the fruit trees that they have planted here at Mount's Botanical Garden. So now we're at the entrance to the uh, edible vegetable garden here and uh, on this little plaque it says a few things so I want to share with you right quick. It says, uh, with fluctuating economic situations and the desire for organic foods, home vegetable garden uh, is becoming increasingly popular. With Florida's unique climate, our season to grow and harvest most vegetables takes place in the winter months. Sowing seeds in November, cultivating the plants through the early spring harvest is a new concept for many newcomers to the region. This garden explores what will grow well in South Florida, as well as incorporating herbs, tropical fruits, and edible flowers. So well, one of my missions is to spread the knowledge that, you know, the gardening season, wherever you live, does not have to be confined to the season that they say, like, you know, it says, oh, you gotta, you know, with the unique growing season, most vegetables take place in the winter months. Hogwash, you can grow completely through the summer here. I mean, look, in nature around you, the grass grows in the summer and the winter, the shrubs and trees grow in the summer and winter. The problem is when people come in from out of town and they're from the northern climates and they come to South Florida and they wanna grow the things they grew in the north. Well, yeah, you could only grow those in the winter time, but there's plenty of tropical perennial edible vegetables and tropical plants that love the heat that'll do well in this climate. So you just have to start growing those in the summer instead of trying to grow that lettuce in the summertime and, you know, it totally failing. So uh, in this garden today, it looks like they have a lot of standard northern crops that'll do good with the more mellow weather. They also have a few things that are going to do well throughout the summer, but later on uh, when I go through the uh, some of the vendors here at the plant sale. I'll share some of the plants with you guys that you can grow pretty much throughout the year here in South Florida. So I guess first let's uh, go ahead and take a walk around the vegetable garden and uh, share with you guys what they're growing right now. All right, so here's a tour of the walk through on the vegetable garden. Now, you know, they do have a lot of non-edibles, uh, but they do have some edibles mixed in. So if you look closely, that plant right there, the spiny one, it's a pineapple, and pineapples are just something that are going to grow really well here in South Florida. I mean, that is a tropical plant. Next door here, here's another edible, and it's actually quite huge. I wonder what they're doing to the soil. It's actually a, it's like a cauliflower that's actually producing some nice uh, heads and be going to flower soon. And also, don't forget that all your cauliflower leaves, and these leaves are huge, are great for eating. 
can cook them up. I actually like to juice them or put them into uh, some smoothies there. Uh, also, you know, they have a lot of uh, non-edible flowers like the ones right there that I don't know because I discriminate against plants. I only know the edible ones. <laughs> but right next door, they got some nasturtiums. So the nasturtiums uh, look like they might be having some heat challenges right now, but looks like they've been growing good and the nasturtium leaves are edible and also the flowers as well. And check it out, here's a hardy patio avocado, Mexicola. Hey, that's the kind that I grow, especially with the uh, weather here in South Florida, especially if you get that freeze that one year and 10 years, it could you could lose your tree. But if you uh, get a cold hardy version, you're more assured that it'll be safe when you do get those cold spells. And there's a little Mexicola avocado on the tree, gonna ripen up here one of these days. Continuing down on the tour of the garden, looks like they got some watermelon. Watermelons are gonna do really well down here due to the heat. Also got some onions. All right, so continuing on the tour of the uh, garden here, looks like they got some uh, peppers, hot peppers. They're gonna definitely do well in the uh, climate here in South Florida, hot weather. Peppers love the, the heat, much like uh, eggplants. Over here, looks like they got some carrots coming in and also some more onions. In addition, they have some, uh, looks like some beets and some turnips growing. And uh, over here, it looks like they got some beans and some tomatoes. So let's talk about tomatoes for a second. If you're gonna grow the tomatoes, I recommend growing the uh, tomatoes that are small. So the small fruiting varieties, such as the cherry tomatoes, are gonna withstand the weather better. And I always encourage you guys to grow the heirloom tomatoes that are native to your region. Luckily in uh, South Florida here, you guys have got the uh, Everglades tomato, Everglades cherry tomato, and they're gonna do really well here uh, year round as a perennial and uh, keep producing for you throughout the weather because they are native to this area. In addition, they have some corn that's not looking super good. And uh, let's see over there, looks like they got some, uh, some fennel growing. Looks like they had some uh, snap beans growing on this trellis earlier in the season. Looks like they're now not making it. And uh, here's some celery probably grown for the celery root, which is an excellent vegetable that I love to eat. In addition, it looks like they got some uh, Swiss chard. So a question I get a lot is, hey John, I got like, you know, raccoons and possums and cats and whatnot getting into my raised beds and either eating my stuff or if you have cats, they're doing their litter stuff in your raised bed and nobody wants that, that's nasty. So, you know, I have had other episodes in the past which you might want to check to basically make simple ways to keep the animals out of your raised beds and here's just yet another simple one I'd like to share with you guys today. I mean, it's just by simply putting some uh, one by two up the side and stapling on some wire mesh, you know, all the way around and maybe leave a little section that opens up so you can get in there and work it or just make this portable so that you actually just remove the whole thing. Maybe make it on a PVC frame or some EMT conduit so you could lift the whole thing off. You even put a roof on it you know, a top on it so that the birds can't get in there either. So you could have a pest proof garden. I mean, in my opinion, it's much more valuable to make a pest proof garden using mechanical methods than spraying toxins or chemicals or other things on your garden. I mean, you just want to exclude things so that they can't get in and you know, so that you can grow your own food. So uh, let's go ahead and show you guys this part of the garden. These are like little raised beds made out of stone. Now, Something that's very important in South Florida is that, you know, we're pretty much on sand here. This is West Palm Beach. You want to bring in some good uh, soil to grow in. As also in this side, they got some, uh, looks like some cabbage, some broccoli, some kale, and uh, some of the coal crops, cruciferous crops. Now, if you're going to want to grow one through the summertime, only recommend growing the Georgia collards because uh, they will withstand the cold as well as the heat. They love the heat, actually. And uh, let's see here, we got some ornamental kale and some, uh, some peppers growing. And uh, I'm not seeing a whole lot of variety or whole lots of cool, different and unusual things growing. Just some of your standard northern crops. Here's one that's kind of cool that's going to do really well in the climate here, which is the eggplant. The eggplant really loves the heat. It's going to do super well uh, through the summertime here, even in the hot temperatures and the humidity. Uh, but it doesn't like, you know, when it frosts. And you may be able to keep this alive as a perennial if you do protect it just a little bit uh, during the cold winter months. Now besides all the edible vegetables they have, they also have a whole bunch of different fruit trees. So uh, let's go over and share some of those with you. Of course, they got things like the banana. 
Now, if I lived in South Florida, I would definitely plant some bananas. I don't particularly care for store-bought bananas because they have no flavor to me. But if you plant your own banana, you could grow some really cool varieties that taste totally amazing. And as you guys know, things that you grow yourself are going to taste way better than stuff bought from the store. The prime example is the tomatoes. Let's see, they got a whole bunch of other kind of cool, unique uh, fruit trees here. Here's a wax jambu fruit. I think I might have had that once. I don't quite remember what it is. So here's a cool example of container gardening. They basically just have a little uh, tomato trellis and um, some plants growing in this nursery pot. And it looks like some little uh, kind of cucumbers. And uh, another thing they're growing that's really cool, it looks like it's doing pretty good in this climate, is uh, actually in a little sunken uh, tub there. So they sunk it in the ground and that's for a particular reason, to keep the plants uh, being grown in it within it because some of these plants will escape and become invasive on you. It looks like they got the Carolina golden gold rice and also the chufa. And I'm really familiar with the chufa. This is the chufa right here. Turkeys love chufa. So if you want to attract turkeys for whatever reason to your property, grow the chufa. They love to dig them up. But I personally like to dig up the little chufa nuts and eat them. They're not that high in fat. They're actually kind of starchy, but they taste quite good just raw out of the ground. Be sure to check my past videos where I do talk about growing chufa because I have done it before in the past. and. Uh, Chufa is what they originally made horchata out of. All right, continuing along here, they got a lot of different kinds of trees. This is a really cool tree it's called our Barbados cherry. And you can see the little cherries up there. This would be a perennial that would produce, you know, many times during the year. And let me see, here's some uh, green ones in there and there's one that's not quite ripe. Back in there, it's kind of orange. And as they get really ripe, they get red. Now these guys are not like a traditional cherry. They're a little bit tart. But, uh, you know, I definitely like them and I'd have one of these, if, once again, if I lived in South Florida. Here's another uh, fruiting crop that I never had before and there were some ripe on the ground earlier. Yeah, but now there's none. This is actually called the June Plum. And uh, I don't know if I've had one of these before. Here's one of my favorite fruit trees in the world. It's actually uh, probably towering at maybe, I don't know, uh, 20 feet tall. These guys get really tall. This is probably the world's largest fruit. And what this is called, and we'll have to show you guys this, this is cool, it's called the jackfruit. And uh, as you can see, they literally grow out of the trunk. This is the base of the tree, and you can see them growing down there. These fruits could get up to like 100 pounds. And uh, these guys are totally amazing. These guys are so delicious. These guys are immature yet. Um, they're not quite ripe. Uh, sometimes you can buy the fruits, depending on where you live, at like a produce market. But that's, it's very rare. You got to go to like to an ethnic market to buy them. And uh, I generally get them for about a dollar to two dollars a pound, the West Coast, and they've been grown in Mexico. Here it is right here. These guys, what these guys taste like is when you cut it open, uh, it smells, you'll smell it when it's ripe, it smells just sweet, fragrant, and when you eat these guys, it tastes like the juicy fruit gum. I mean, they model juicy fruit gum after the jackfruit, not the other way around. So man, grow a jackfruit tree if you live in South Florida, you'll be feasting on some delicious fruits. One of my favorite, actually. Over on this side, you might be thinking, John, why are they growing peaches? Can you even grow peaches? I mean, this is the tropics. You could grow peaches in the tropics. Well, these are actually called the low chill peaches. So they don't need a whole lot of chill hours to grow. That being said, I wouldn't waste my time on low chill peaches in the tropics. I would just grow some tropical fruit. To me, they're much more valuable than any kind of northern peaches that you could grow you know, in the north easily, but in the south here, it's gonna be much more difficult. All right, let's take a look at a couple more trees here. Here's one of my favorite trees that actually I grow in California. You could also grow it here. It's a subtropical tree, but will do good in the tropics. As you can see, it looks like it's having some insect issues here. With the leaves getting eaten. I don't have any insect issues in California, but this is actually called the loquat tree. So no, it's not related to the kumquat. This is a loquat. And as you can see, here's some fruit that's forming up here. Uh, it's ready now. It's uh, early for what I'm used to because my fruit would, because my trees would fruit a little bit later on in the season. But uh, these are evergreen, so they keep their leaves. They're often used in landscaping, actually, in California and also here in Florida. So if you do want to buy a loquat tree, I do encourage you to get a named variety, which we'll actually take a look at in a little bit. The named varieties will generally have larger fruits and probably taste better because they've been bred for certain qualities. Whereas if you just take seeds out of the fruit and plant it like I did, you never know what you're gonna get. But if you supplement with rock dust and a good soil, you're gonna definitely be guaranteed a better and larger 
uh, fruits. All right, let's take a look at some more trees here. Now, one of the trees that's really easy to grow would be the mango. The mango is a tropical tree and it will grow really well here in South Florida. That being said, I'd encourage you guys to grow trees that are uncommon. So while mangoes are fairly common, you know, grow some jackfruit that's much more uncommon. I mean, you might have 100 year old mango trees already on many properties and they sell for relatively inexpensive. And yes, they're great trees and will produce a lot. But I always encourage people to grow things that money can't buy that you can't normally find, like some of these unique varieties of fruits that are super delicious and actually, if you go to buy them, are quite expensive. Let me see if I could find one of those next. Here's an, a huge avocado tree that's going to have lots of fruit on it. Uh, this, this tree is really cool. It's actually called an allspice. So this is how they get the allspice on here and just uh, smelling, cracking one of these leaves and smelling it. Wow, it just smells so fragrant. That's amazing. You could uh, potpourri your house with those guys. Let's take a look, a couple more fruit trees here. So if I did have some property here in South Florida, one of the trees I'd be growing is the uh, star fruit or the carambola. While I don't particularly care for the star fruits that much, the reason why I like the star fruit is because they will produce, you know, several times during a year where some fruiting trees will only produce once a year. Also, there are sweet varieties of the star fruit and varieties that are a little bit more sour. So you want to definitely taste test the star fruit variety before you buy it to ensure you're going to like it. Here's another crop that will grow in South Florida. I don't know that I'd necessarily plant one. It's the pomegranate. I like pomegranates, but not as much as some of the other tropical fruits that you can grow, such as the one next door. This is actually a guava tree. So, you know, uh, guava trees are uh, will grow like weeds on your property. They may actually take over, self-seed, and start more. But, you know, one of the things I like to grow is uh, fruits that you can't buy at the store that are horrible store-bought. So the guavas are often sold, um, you know, far before they're really truly ripe. And to get really ripe guavas, you need to have your own tree. And uh, that's yet another reason why I'd buy some of my own fruit trees to get fruits of much higher quality than money can buy. So now we're going to check out some of the vendors here at the Mounts Botanical Garden plant sale. And, uh, you know, while there's a lot of vendors here selling uh, native Florida plants and other, you know, um, ornamental plants, I'm just going to cover the edibles because that's what I'm all about. I want you guys to grow some of your own food. And there's so many cool vendors here. We're going to go ahead and spotlight a hand flown for you guys and this is especially useful if you live in South Florida. Now many of these vendors will not ship. There are a few that might ship to you so you always want to contact them and I will give their uh, website details to get further information. So I guess uh, let's head out and check out some of these vendors. Right, so now we're at the booth of the Mounts Guild and what they do is they propagate uh, the plants for mounts here but they also sell them to the public. So besides at plant sales they also do have sales here on the property a few times a week. You want to learn more at the website of Mounts Botanical Garden at mounts.org. Now the reason why I'm here today is because they do have some edibles at the booth here. A lot are un not edible, but they have some herbs and also some hot season tomatoes. So if you are going to plant tomatoes here in the summertime in uh, South Florida, you want to definitely make sure you grow a hot season one or one that's going to handle the, the heat. Many tomatoes shut down at like 90 degrees and will not really produce reliably for you. But these ones hopefully will do significantly better than others. So the hot season tomatoes that they're offering today are FLA 91, uh, Heat Wave 2, Solar Fire, Fire Super Sooks, Hybrex, uh, Sweetie, Arkansas Traveler, Abe Lincoln, Chocolate Cherokee, and the Equinox. So that'll give you some uh, varieties to play with whether you live in South Florida or other areas that have high heat during the summer. Right, so now we're at another cool booth and this is the booth of the tropicalbamboo.com. They have a nursery here in Loxahatchee and you might be thinking, John, I thought, you know, why are you at a bamboo booth, you know, that's selling bamboo plants or grasses? You know, they're not edible. Well, think again. I mean, pandas eat bamboo while we can't necessarily eat the bamboo. We can't eat the bamboo shoots. And, you know, I learned today that all bamboo are actually edible if you cook them long enough. They Most varieties have high levels of toxins, cyanides, and things that you don't want to eat. But if you cook them, you could cook it out of the bamboo. But there are varieties that have lower concentrations of those. And some varieties are really fine to actually eat raw when they're young. And especially if they're covered and kept away from the sun. Once the young shoots come up, you want to mulch over them, put a bucket over them to keep them dark and then they'll be actually a much more better tasting than if the sun gets to them and then they'll start tasting kind of gross. 
So yes, all bamboos can be edible if properly prepared. You could also pickle bamboo and that's something else that I learned today. So here at the Tropical Bamboo, they feature the tropical bamboos. You know, these are the southern bamboos that grow well in the tropics like here in South Florida, like Hawaii. Uh, these are the clumping bamboos, not the spreading bamboos of the north. So, uh, you know, while they have a few samples of some of the bamboo plants they brought from their nursery, they have about 160 varieties now, and pretty soon they'll have over 250 varieties, probably the largest collection of the tropical bamboos anywhere. You know, there's a good handful that are definitely good to eat uh, and are edible. So you could go to their website and do a search for um, edible bamboos and they'll come all up. So today, because I only brought a small selection, I'm gonna share with you guys the one variety that they brought today that's uh, edible and probably the best one for edibility, but maybe not the best one compared to all the different varieties they have because I think they only brought maybe like a dozen varieties or so today. So one of the varieties that's good for eating, once again, when the shoots are coming out the ground is this variety right here. This is actually called the Giant Bamboo. And uh, one of the cool things at the booth here is they have free giveaways. And I love free giveaways, especially when they're useful giveaways. So what we have here is they're giving away little calipers so you can measure uh, the girth. Not your girth, the bamboo's burnt girth. <laughs> so this bamboo uh, grass here is a four inch girth. And how do you compare that? So now you guys might be wondering, John, what the heck are you like sitting next to you? What is this, man, like an armadillo tail? <laughs> well, no, it's actually not. This is actually like the clumping bamboo underneath the ground. This is like the network of the, the roots here. I mean, these are just two uh, bamboos that have been harvested and they actually made a nice sign out of it. But this shows you the clumping bamboo network. And below here, this is like the, the root system. And uh, they just, uh, you know, are very short because of the clumping style. Now the running bamboo, this little section here, could be like 35 feet long. And that's why I like the clumping kind. The clumping kind actually grows in a permaculture situation in the forest. You know, they'll grow with other plants. They'll grow really tall to get the sun, whereas the standard running bamboo will really take over the forest and be its own forest in itself. So uh, I definitely like the clumping bamboo and that's what they feature here at tropicalbamboo.com which is the website you can find all the different varieties of bamboo. Now I only recommend you guys grow this in a controlled environment or if you have like you know live in somewhere where it's the tropics. You know they do ship all over the country and you know especially if you're in like southern California or southern Texas some of the varieties they sell will also work there because they are all by zone. You know, so that's really cool. Next, what we're going to take a look at is actually a, a variety of the bamboo that they brought here today. That's probably the most edible one because they only brought maybe about a dozen varieties or so. They have a lot more on the website. Now I want to share with you guys the most edible variety they brought here from the nursery. And they only have a handful today, so I asked the owner and he said that this variety here, the uh, old hammy variety, is probably the most edible for shoots here, but it'd be probably far better to go to the nursery to get one that would meet your specific needs. You know, bamboos are used for many different things nowadays, like construction, they use it for construction. Not only the whole timbers, you could actually use it for staking and trellising in your garden. Uh, they actually take the, the whole timbers and will grind up the pulp, the fiber, to make like compressed bamboo, you know, like two by fours and whatnot. You know, I use bamboo as a bamboo cutting board. They're actually quite hard and bamboo, unlike trees, grow significantly faster and actually are quite hard. So I like bamboo as a as a natural resource to use for gardening. Hey, I want to see somebody line their beds with actually bamboo as the edging. I think that'd be really cool as well. Also, I use bamboos for straws when I'm drinking, you know, some drinks sometimes. So uh, this is the most uh, edible variety for the young shoots. So be sure to visit their website, tropicalbamboo.com, to learn more about the edible bamboos and order your bamboo if you'd like to uh, try to get some. So now we're at the booth of the Light Chief Fruit Store and they specialize in actually growing tropical fruits and supplying people and uh, wholesale for the local area to give them some of the best tasting tropical fruits that you grow here in South Florida. Now besides the tropical fruits that they sell and today they're happen to be selling sapodilla or brown sugar fruit or chico sapote. These guys when they're ripe taste like brown sugar to me. They're one of my favorite tropical fruits. They also have some uh, Florida Everglades tomato, which are the native tomatoes of this area that grow really well in this climate. They got some in-shell macadamia nuts. Macadamia nuts are probably one of my favorite type of nuts. They also have some custard apples that I think they sold out of. And of course, one of my other favorite tropical fruits right here, 
It's called the jackfruit. These guys get up to like 100 pounds and they have some available today. But besides selling the fruits, actually, they start uh, and propagate the fruit trees, the tropical fruit trees that they grow on their farm. And, you know, unlike many uh, nurseries that are just simply resellers of the fruit trees, they grow the majority of the fruit trees themselves and propagate them themselves by techniques like air layering or taking cuttings and even grafting in some instances. So they have a nice wide variety that they've all grown themselves. So if you want to buy some of the tropical fruits that they grow or some of the trees that they're propagating, you want to visit their Facebook page, Lychee Fruit Store, on Facebook and you'll see their hours and contact information. They are only open by appointment only. All right, so I'm really excited to show you this next booth. It's actually called the D&G Fruit Trees and Herbs. Now they grow all their own trees and herbs that they're there to sell you. And the reason why I like this place is because they have the widest varieties of plants that'll truly do well here in South Florida. So uh, let's head over and share some of the cool, unique varieties of plants they're offering today. So now we're gonna share a few more plants that are available here. And uh, number one, we got the uh, Costa Rican mint. So the Costa Rican mint, it's actually a nice uh, shrubby type plant. And this is gonna do very well in the you know South Florida environment, the tropics. You could have a mint easily growing. Uh, one of the, my favorite plants at this whole booth is right here. This is called the Okinawan spinach. Now why this is very uh, valuable to you if you live in South Florida is because this is what's called the perennial edible leafy green vegetable. That's really long. But what that means is you're going to simply plant this once and it's provided it doesn't get too cold here and have a weird cold snap. This guy will just continue to grow out and provide leaves for you to eat like in a salad year round. So uh, I wish I could only grow this one in uh, California and I have tried to grow it in the greenhouse and it just doesn't make it so I won't bother until I move to the tropics one day. But if you live in South Florida you definitely want to get some of these uh, perennial edible leafy green vegetables. Now they do sell the Okinawan spinach here and uh, sometimes they'll also have other leafy green vegetables that you can grow like the katuk and the moringa. He didn't actually bring any today but he has grown them in the past. Now I'm going to get to show you guys some more plants that I'm learning about because you know a lot of these plants actually believe it or not are new to me because the tropics is not my normal growing region. I'm not familiar with some of the plants here actually. So when I saw this plant I'm like oh I know that plant. That's a Cuban oregano and then I look at the tag and it's not Cuban oregano and sometimes things have different tags and different names for the same thing. But in fact it's not the Cuban oregano because right next door they all they have the Cuban oregano and while these look very similar and you probably won't be able to see that on the camera they're actually two different plants so you know always be sure you know what you're talking about you know uh, before eating anything actually so this is the Cuban oregano it's used actually as a as a flavoring agent and next door we have the what's called the Vix vapor rub or also called poor hound and uh, actually this one's really cool, it, it's high in I believe camphor and I actually took a leaf and rubbed it on my skin and it made it feel really warm. So a lot of the different um, plants he's selling here actually are herbal and medicinals, much like this one right here that I've never heard about either. It's actually called leaf of life. So how many of you guys wanna grow the leaf of life so that you can have life? This is also used for medicinal purposes and I really don't know a whole bunch about it so I'm gonna have to look it up and do some more research on it. So here at D&G, they're offering many different kinds of herbs. And once again, some of them I don't even know because it's from uh, Jamaica, which is where the owner is originally from. So this is actually called the Guinean weed. And the Guinean weed, he, he told me, is uh, good for uh, preventing cancer and things like that. Of course, you know, you need to do your own research and I can't make any medical claims, but this is what is purported. I mean, actually the Okinawan spinach that I showed uh, earlier, you know, I've heard other people say it's good for blood sugar regulation. You know, my solution is to eat a nice, rich diet full of uh, plants and vegetables, including some leaves from these kinds of plants so that you'll get that in you so you don't have to take like a lot of it, you know, in any one time. So uh, here's an ex excellent example of growing things in the sun and growing things in the shade. Uh, these two plants here, they're both the guinean weed, but one was grown in the shade, one was grown in full sun, and so they'll color up different despite being the same plants. So I always encourage you guys to experiment with where you're growing your crops. Sometimes some plants might do better in the sun or better in the shade. It's always best to grow fruiting crops in the sun no matter what, and I like to always get away with trying to grow you know, leafing crops in the shade so that I don't have to use my valuable sun space for that. 
Uh, in addition, they got other cool things. They actually call it the sushi mint here, which I call shiso, which is actually a really high in omega-3 fatty acids, the seeds itself. And uh, he said here in this climate, this will grow, drop seeds, and then basically the seeds will germinate on their own and come back for you each and every year. So that's definitely really cool. I guess uh, I want to cover just a few more unique varieties of herbs and plants that he's offering here. Then we're going to check out probably like one more booth today. The next two crops that I'm going to show you guys, I'm glad actually he has available for people so that people can grow more of their own food at home. This first one here is actually called sugar cane. So sugar cane is easily propagated by actually just uh, getting a stick of sugar cane at like your local supermarket, chopping it off, putting it in the ground, and it'll actually sprout and grow into new plants. That being said, besides doing that, it's always easier to get an established plant because that's going to be, you know, more likely that you're going to have guaranteed success. And uh, these are only $10 to grow your own sugar cane. You can then juice the sugar cane and have sugar cane juice or then dehydrate the juice to make your own sugar at home. I want to do that one of these days. I love sugar cane juice and get to enjoy it when I come visit South Florida. Now the next guy here is actually called the chayote. That chayote squash vine is a really valuable plant besides growing just the squash, which is not related to the standard squash that we know and love. You can harvest chayote and uh, you can't eat it raw, although most people do cook it. The reason why I like the chayote vine is because of the tips. So these little flowering tips at the top, you could just break these off and like add them to your salad. And this thing will grow prolifically. You just grow it and it's gonna vine out for a long way and keep growing, especially if it doesn't frost, it can grow pretty much year round in the climate here. So you gotta be careful. And if you do cut it back, it'll start to reshoot out of the ground if you do wanna you know, keep it maintained and keep it nice and small. So now I'm so excited to share some more plants with you. Uh, first, we got over here what I know as epizote, but uh, in Jamaica they call it worm bush. That's because it's good for deworming. I knew it's good for you know reducing the flatulence when you're cooking your beans. And I actually personally like the taste. Some people says it tastes like gasoline. But now I know that it's good for deworming too, because of the the high you know uh, uh, flavors in there. Most people don't like it, but I like to just snack on some epizote to to learn that it's good for deworming definitely is good to know and that's something I learned new today also I mean the owner here is so full of knowledge with you know living the natural lifestyle in Jamaica where they didn't have all these you know stores and drug stores to buy things they had to use the natural plants and he is a wealth of knowledge with this he's been growing food for a long time over here of course is the uh, standard Callaloo and this is another edible leafy green it's really cool and uh, definitely in South Florida, you want to grow like one of each of all these things to get your garden started. Most of these things and plants that he's selling are perennial. So that means you're just going to invest in the plant once and they're going to continue to live and make food or medicinal herbs for you year round. Another thing that I recommend too is also, you know, in South Florida, you want to plant some trees. So one of the trees that I would highly encourage you guys to plant is this one right here. It's only 15 bucks for this tree. This is actually called an ackee tree. And I know most of you guys have probably never heard of ackee. This fruit is used in the national dish of Jamaica. It's the ackee fruit. Now the ackee fruit only grows in the tropics and uh, it has to be fully ripe to eat when it's raw. It actually opens up like a little flower and it reveals its little like a uh, fruit pulp and a seed. Now you eat the little fruit pulp area and it's like a nice fatty fruit. I mean, it's unlike any fruit you've tasted. It's kind of like, very similar to avocado that it's a high fat fruit but it has a really unique flavor and you got to get them completely ripe because when they're not ripe they could be poisonous so man I can't wait to the next time I try some fresh tree ripened ackee fruit so now I'm going to share with a few more plants with you guys here I can't show them all because he has so many different unique varieties and he focused on growing rare varieties and making these available to people so I definitely think that's really cool right here he's growing some arrowroot and arrow was really popular probably before wheat and things like that. And uh, here's a vanilla a orchid plant. So yes, you can grow your own vanilla beans if you live here in South Florida in the tropics. I definitely like vanilla much more than chocolate. So if you want to get any of these plants, you want to call D&G. They're here in the West Palm Beach. Their phone number is 561-833-3975. Uh, at present time, he does not ship, but hopefully soon he will start shipping. That being said, I can only encourage you guys to grow these plants in the tropics, in the weather here, in other parts of the country, like in north, northern climates, 
probably not going to make it. You're probably not going to be able to grow the Aki <laughs> unless you live somewhere in the tropics because it's not going to take the cold weather. All right, so next I'm going to get to show you guys my favorite booth at this whole place. It's right here. It's actually called Vertical Garden Kits. And why is this my favorite booth? Because it allow, gives you a system that easily lets you grow food even if you've never done it before. So next I'm going to go into the booth and share with you guys this vertical system that could allow anybody, wherever you live, to grow some food at home. So now we're at the booth of Mighty Fine Gardens and their website is MightyFineGardens.com and they have this Mighty Fine Vertical Garden here and that's their product that they make and they've actually dialed in so that you can grow food at home. Now I have shown many of these different vertical garden systems before on my channel. When I visit different strawberry farms or different examples of growing using a vertical gardening kit, but a lot of those systems are not complete. They might sell the equipment, but they don't provide you with the technical support or some of the other things like the soil medium, you know, pumps, timers, and even the uh, nutrient solution that'll go in to grow, uh, you know, some successful plants like they have here. So at Mighty Fine Gardens, they'll basically send you the kit with everything you need except for the pole, the mounting pole, which is available at like a Home Depot, the garbage can or reservoir, like you could use a 55 gallon food grade drum, and the water. Other than that, they're going to provide you with the seeds, the soil medium, the nutrient solution, the pumps, the timers, and everything you need. Even they'll include like a, a tray to start your seeds in that's guaranteed to grow. It's a float system that's ingenious. And in addition, besides you're going to get all that, you're going to get the support you need to ensure that you're going to be successful at doing this. Because a lot of you guys may not have the knowledge and they have a support staff that's going to help you ensure that you do it. Not only do you get an instruction manual when you buy this, you also get it emailed as a PDF document to you. They have videos showing you online and if you really need hand holding, you could call them up and they'll walk you through setting it up in your own home. I mean, there's no other company I know that has this level of customer support that will basically encourage you and walk you through it and if you can't set one of these up, you must be from another planet or at least maybe not understand English. So uh, in here what they're growing are a whole bunch of different things. Now this is a soilless medium. This is like a hydroponic system that's using uh, some really good nutrients including the trace minerals and that's another, si that's another part of why I like the growing system they're using here. They're adding the trace minerals because they are that important to the plants. As you can see, we have some amazing crops that have been grown in the system here from things like char to the top. They got the red sales lettuce, which is a, a good variety to grow here in South Florida. They got also the hottest, one of the hottest peppers in the world, this scorpion Trinidad uh, pepper here. So don't even pick one of those and think about eating it. You'll be in pain. And uh, they got the uh, Joe's Atomic Bomb right here. I mean, they got four peppers in like one pot. Each pot holds four and this has four, uh, eight, 12, 16 plants in this whole setup. And you know, one of the amazing things is this whole setup, including the support and everything you need is under $250. And if you wanna add additional towers, then it's even cheaper because any additional tower is only under a hundred bucks. And actually they're gonna be offering a Growing Your Green special. They're gonna stay tuned for at the end of this. So how this system works is you have a reservoir. They're just having a garbage can right here filled with water and the reason why I like this system is because it's pretty much foolproof. All you're going to do is put the pump in there, get it set up properly. You're going to basically add a little bit of the nutrient solution when you add water and, uh, and then it's just going to go ahead and automatically water for you. The water is going to go up, it's going to trickle down to all the different plants in there and then come down to the bottom. And uh, this can be mounted in the ground or actually you could just put it in a pot that's filled up with cement to keep it stable if you have a patio. So this is an excellent way to grow things on a patio. And you know, many of you guys may have seen the tower garden. That thing's like $500. You know, I'd much rather have one of these or actually several of these with several um, different towers uh, instead of one of the tower gardens. I think this is a much more useful and a better design. Plus you're gonna get much better support in my opinion. So the water dribbles down, it goes out to the bottom. And then if you do are, are on a patio, you could actually, uh, drill a hole so it drains out into the little container so it won't drip on your neighbors below you if you're on the second floor or if you're just on uh, land you could actually have a container below that it just soaks into and then it just soaks through the ground so these systems save a lot of water compared to like just growing in the standard environment I mean water conservation is really huge and this company is going to continue to make advances in saving water with other vertical guarding devices He's told me about a few right now but that's just top secret right now but I'm really excited about this company and some of the work they're doing to uh, make gardening affordable 
and uh, so that you can grow food at home. Once again, uh, the company name is called Mighty Fine Gardens. You could reach them at MightyFineGardens.com to learn more. And to get the special Growing Your Green special, which is 10% off, you want to make sure you mention the code GYG when you place your order. So now we're going to show you guys another crop you guys should definitely be growing if you live anywhere in South Florida. And that's right here behind me. It's uh, The place is called Going Bananas. It's Going-Bananas.com. And they sell banana plants. Banana banana plants are not banana trees because they're not really even a tree but the reason why I think you guys should grow your own bananas in South Florida is because it's really easy now if you live in any part of the US he will ship the banana plants to anywhere in the United States so you could try to grow bananas but they are a tropical plant and need tropical weather to survive and of course if you want to go out and go the extra mile and you know uh, bring it inside in the winter time and plant it outside in the summer and keep doing that and keep having headaches with moving things You could definitely probably grow bananas in most places I've also seen many people grow bananas successfully in climate controlled greenhouses. So uh, let's check out Going bananas next now we're in the booth here and they have a whole bunch of racks and this is called a rack of bananas and uh, You know the banana many banana plants will produce edible bananas and there are some ornamental varieties of bananas and the reason why I think you guys should grow your own bananas is because, you know, if you go to the standard grocery store, you're going to find the standard banana. And many people think that's like the only kind of banana in the world because that's the only kind for the most part they sell. Now, if you go to an ethnic market, you may be able to find like five different varieties of bananas. But for the most part, people eat the Cavendish banana that are picked when green, you know, from uh, South America, Central America, and then shipped up to us. And you know, to me, those kind of just taste like cardboard and it's no surprise that I just really don't like imported bananas. But there's a big difference, as you guys know, between imported fruit and things you grow yourself. I mean, tomatoes are a prime example. You've all had the homegrown tomato and they taste amazing. And then you go to buy tomatoes at the supermarket that are nice and pink in the winter time and they bounce off the ground and they have no flavor. Well, bananas are completely the same way. And besides just the Cavendish, banana, I imagine only ever eating Granny Smith apples. There are so many other varieties of bananas that are available and here at Going Bananas they have over 70 different varieties of bananas and each one tastes unique and have different features. For example, this one here is actually called Thousand Fingers because this banana uh, plant produces maybe even up to a thousand little small bananas on one rack. That's a lot of food. Uh, this banana here is a special variety it's actually a seeded variety banana, so I'm actually going to show this on the video for you guys. No, you give me two. So this is the Black Bull Bisiana, and as you can see, we'll open this guy up here, and there's not only the banana fruit, but there's a whole bunch of little seeds in there. Now, yes, you can eat the fruit, but there's not a lot of fruit in here. It's mostly all the seeds. So you very much got to just suck off the fruit that's inside there. These seeds are about the size of a pious seed. And you know, this is kind of more for like ornamental use, not necessarily, I wouldn't be growing this to eat, but it's definitely a cool curiosity. Now besides this kind, he has other kinds of bananas. Uh, you know, he does not sell the bananas, he only sells the plants. So you could go to the website and learn about all the different kinds of bananas he offers. Next, we're gonna take a look at the sweetest banana that he actually brought here to sample, and I'm gonna to get to sample one good banana. Now, here's a rack of the Nam Wa banana that we're just gonna go ahead and uh, pull off. And uh, no better uh, food than food you uh, grew yourself or a farmer grew themselves. We're gonna go ahead and uh, peel this guy, and you know, these are the kind of bananas that I strive to eat. I usually just don't even bother eating bananas unless they're really good bananas, or unless I just need a cheap, inexpensive uh, filler to get some calories in me. Uh, fr more fruit calories. Wow. It has a flavor like no other banana you've tasted. It's like really super sweet, really nice texture. Now you want to always let your bananas fully ripen. If they're not fully ripe, they're going to be more starchy uh, than when they're uh, fully ripe and they're going to be much more sweet. Next, let's take a look at just a few of the banana plants he brought in his offering today. As you guys can see, I'm sitting in front of a whole bunch of different varieties of banana plants, and they brought probably over a dozen varieties here to offer to people, but they have over 70 varieties and up to 90 different varieties at the farm. Now, uh, how they propagate these or how bananas are normally propagated is uh, once you buy one plant, you have these little babies or pups coming up. Generally, you want to leave one pup growing next to the mother plant so it's going to replace the mother plant because the banana 
plant is only going to produce one bunch of bananas and then that's it. You're going to cut this guy down and then you're going to let the, uh, the new one follow in its place. The new one, the pup, forms in about six months after you know you plant the main plant. Uh, this one actually has a few pups at the bottom. So what you would do is you would leave one and cut the other two off and put them in new pots. So to start the plants here at going-bananas.com, they actually don't harvest the pups. They actually tissue culture the bananas in a certified laboratory that's sterile. So you're going to get disease-free plants that can be shipped anywhere in the United States, including California. So the next question is, if you don't live in South Florida, which you should come visit their nursery and pick out a whole bunch of different styles of banana plants and grow them and get your own bananas that taste far better than anything from the grocery store. If you do need to uh, have some shipped to you, what varieties would you want to get? Well, they do have some varieties of bananas that will grow up to four feet, five feet, or even eight feet tall and stay relatively small. So you can grow these in a container. I'd recommend as large of a diameter container as possible. Minimum size I would recommend is like a wine barrel size for some of the smaller varieties. Uh, the roots don't go very deep, but they like to go out and spread out laterally. Besides container growth, if you do want to have a banana shipped to you to try, the variety I would recommend is Viente Cajol, and that variety is good because it'll grow. You could plant it in the summertime. In the wintertime, you're gonna basically cut it, cut it back and then uh, mulch heavily and keep the rhizome and the root system alive. If it has any pups, you're gonna actually cut those out and actually uh, repot them, put them in a garage, keep them nice and warm, or maybe even a, you know, a sunny window inside your house to keep those guys going. And then when it, in springtime, if it does come back, it's gonna you know, come back right where it left off. So you, know, you can successfully grow bananas, although the whole cycle is a total of 18 months from planting it to growing some bananas. So with this information, you'll now be able to grow some bananas, definitely in South Florida, but potentially no matter where you live by using some of these techniques. If you do choose to grow bananas, you know, get some of the smaller varieties in a container or once again that other variety where you could plant it out and uh, mulch it over the winter and uh, save the pups over the winter so you could plant out next season if you do lose your, your big root mass. So if you want to learn more about some of these banana varieties or order them yourself, you want to visit going-bananas.com. Well, I've saved the best for last. Now we're going to show you the booth of actually uh, Hopkins Tropical Fruit Nursery. Now, Hopkins is a wholesale nursery. So this what this means is that you can't visit them. They won't ship or anything like that. But what you can do is that they sell through a network of uh, independent garden centers and nurseries throughout the Gulf region. So between Florida and Texas, you can probably find their trees. So what you're going to want to do is actually, if you like any of the trees that I'm talking about, you're going to actually email them and ask them if they have any uh, nurseries or garden centers in your area so you can support local businesses and also get some of the cool trees that I'll be showing you in a minute. And now we're going to talk about another tree here. Now this is not necessarily a fruit tree. What this is actually, this is called the pigeon pea. And the pigeon pea is actually a nitrogen fixing tree that actually will fix nitrogen so it'll enrich the soil and actually you could uh, chop it and actually drop it to uh, you know uh, add nutrients to your soil but it also makes some pigeon peas that you can also eat so uh, I like that this is a very useful tree and here they're only selling them for ten dollars that's definitely a good price for the pigeon pea of course you know you're gonna have to contact them to find a local uh, nursery in your area that can order uh, from the company here so that you can't get them because this company will not ship directly. Another tree they're offering here is the, the Moringa and I like the Moringa also called the horse radish tree and sometimes they call it a drumstick tree depending on where you go and the uh, Moringa tree actually has uh, the edible leaves that you can't eat raw though they're quite you know uh, hot tasting. Uh, you would want to harvest the smaller leaves they're definitely much better. Uh, this is a tree that's good for zones 9 and 10 it doesn't take the frost, but you can grow these like outside in the summer, put them in a big pot and then grow them inside. Make sure you put some good lights on them in the winter time to keep them alive so that you can have access to these very nutritious leafy greens. If you go to like a health food store, you know, they're now selling like powdered Moringa leaves, but always better than buying a powder is to grow the food fresh yourself and uh, especially use nutrient dense soil. So make sure you use compost and things like the rock dust and some of the other things that I recommend in my videos so that you can grow 
really healthy plants that are gonna not only be good for the plant, but also when you harvest the leaves, nourish you as well. So now I'm gonna share some more uh, trees and plants with you guys that are gonna do well here in South Florida and the tropics. So when I go to Hawaii, they're growing this kind of raspberry in Hawaii. It's actually called the Mysore raspberry. And this is a tropical raspberry. You know, standard plants from the north are not gonna do well here in the tropics with the high humidity and the, the heat and the weather. But this guy, if you want raspberries, is the one you want to start growing. Next, we're going to look at some grapes that are going to do well here in the south, you know, because standard, regular grapes not going to do so well with all the humidity. So if you want to grow grapes, don't grow the standard kind of wine grapes or table grapes. You want to grow muscadine grapes. Unfortunately, I don't have a whole lot of experience with muscadines. I did have some off my friend's uh, tree or vine in uh, Alabama when I was visiting. But the muscadines are the kind of grapes that are going to do really well here in the south. And no matter where you live, I always encourage you guys to, you know, uh, grow the plants. They're going to do really well in your, your area. One of the things I like about the uh, Hopkins Tropical Fruit Nursery is that they're a local nursery. And they really specialize and uh, ensure that the plants are going to do well. Like, you know, there's many different rootstocks you can put some of these cold, hardy plants on. And on certain varieties, like the avocados, they use the, the really cold, hardy rootstock and some other you know growers may not so even though the above the graft is uh, cold tolerant below the graft may not be so i'd like that they really optimize and get into the nuts and bolts of it, ensuring that you're going to have the best quality uh, tree and plant to grow you know in your specific region so another thing that i like about the nursery is that they have a lot of different plants besides the standard muscadine that i just showed you guys they have this new variety it's a patented variety it's a bunch slash muscadine hybrid. So this is a cross between the standard table grape and the muscadine. And it's actually quite beautiful. I don't know if you guys could see the, the difference in the leaves there. This is the standard muscadine and these guys. Some of those more jagged leaves and stuff. And I've never tried one of these fruits. Hopefully one day I'll get to try it. And you know, that leads me to my next uh, you know recommendation for you guys is to experiment with different kind of crops. Maybe you'll grow the standard muscadine and you just don't like the flavor. But maybe you'll grow this, which is the, the cross between the standard muscadine and the standard table grape, and you'll be like, wow, that's amazing. And, but if you don't grow them, you'll never know. And I mean, I don't know anybody that grows this variety, and I've never even tasted it yet. So maybe one of my viewers will grow it, uh, and then I'll come visit your house and get to try it one of these days. And it'll be good because it'll be growing in rock dust and compost, right? So the next uh, tree that I'm going to go over with you guys is actually called the Cherry of the Rio Grande, and it's a Eugenia, and I have grown a, or tried to grow a Eugenia, and, California, Northern California, and it just didn't make it. But I was told this uh, tree can survive down to like the single digits. So that means you'll be able to grow this like in a wide uh, variety of places. Now the fruits are definitely not like a cherry. They have a little bit of a stringent to them. It's very important to harvest these when they're absolutely ripe. And actually I really like the flavor. They're probably really high in antioxidants. So this is gonna be one to try. I don't know about the other Eugenia that I grew before, but I probably wanna definitely try uh, this specific variety to see if I could get it to actually uh, stay alive in the cold weather and cold winters in California. So one of the main reasons why I stopped to film at this booth today is because the work they do with the cold hardy avocados. Like avocados are one of my favorite foods and in, in the, you know, the west of the United States, you know, they can be fairly inexpensive to buy, like three for a dollar. That being said, things you grow at your house yourself are always going to taste better and, you know, be worth no amount of money. So while I am growing my own avocados, I do buy them sometimes because my tree is not fruiting yet because I didn't get a super cold hardy that's handling the frost. So what they do here is they propagate the cold hardy varieties and have many different varieties. So this is cool. It says cold hardy down to 15 and these are the varieties. The Brazos Bell, the Fantastic, the Joy, the Leela, the Pancho. And these are some of the ones that I showed in my avocado video that I had. Uh, down here they have varieties specifically for the Florida region. Orlando and North. They got the Broda, Brogdon de Mexicola, Mexicola Grande, Winter Mexican, Orlando and South. They got the Choquette, the Hall, the Lula, the Marcus Pumpkin, the Monroe, and South Florida and Coastal. These are the most tropical ones. The uh, Beer Knicker, Pollock, the Red Russell, the Russell, and the Simmons. So you know, you always gotta buy the right tree that's gonna do well in your specific climate zone. If you try to grow some South Florida avocados in you know, Tennessee, where it doesn't get too cold, it's not gonna make it. That's why you need the cold hardy ones. You know, what I like to do is always what I call hedge my bets. It's always better 
to grow the cold hardy varieties if you like the fruits in a place even like South Florida because on that one tenth year that you get that super cold freeze these guys are going to make it and some of these others may not or you may have to protect them to keep alive. So next let's take a look at actually some of the cold hardy varieties that they're offering here. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the uh, cold hardy avocados and they have several varieties here that I had just mentioned. They're cold hardy between uh, 16 to 18 degrees depending on the variety. That being said, you would not want to plant one of these young trees out and expect it to survive that cold weather. They need to be of established age. So once again, we got our standard calipers here to measure the girth of the avocado tree, silly. And it should be at least four inches for a nice established tree. And then it could survive these low temperatures. Of course, when your trees, even though they are cold hardy, when they're young, they're like little babies and they do need to be protected. Actually, I built a little greenhouse around my Mexicola avocado tree for the first year. And then since then, I've taken that off and just let it do its thing. And if it's not gonna make it, it's not gonna make it. You know, that's my style of garden. I don't wanna like have to baby all my trees and plants to get fruit. I want them to be able to produce on their own. So one of the reasons why I like the Hopkins Tropical Fruit Nurse is because they use the cold hardy uh, rootstock for these cold hardy avocados to ensure that you're gonna have the best possible chance of your avocado uh, surviving the cold weather. To learn more about them or to find a local nursery near you if you live in the Gulf states, once again, between Florida and Texas, you wanna contact them at, at hopkinstropicalfruitnursery.com. I've had an amazing time here at the uh, plant sale at Mount's Botanical Gardens, but it's getting late and I gotta go. I'm giving a talk tonight on growing food. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode. I always encourage you guys to visit local plant sales to buy all your plants and support local companies that are gonna support you to grow your own food at home. Once again, my name is John Kohler with growingyourgreens.com. We'll see you next time. And remember, keep on growing.